so hello everyone, I'm Substack, and I will, I can't even read that because my screen doesn't show me everything. Um, hang on, I, I, this, I can't do this. Unless you want to see a really small screen. Err, grumble. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I chose poorly. Sorry, you guys. You have to suffer. Oh no! Now it's not probably gonna. What? What? I can fix that. Okay. Well, this is a bad size, but oh, uh, okay. Um, actually, if I just look at the screen that way, that will work. I don't know. This is weird. Andrew is on the case. Okay. Yes, I can't read it though, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well I'll just roll with it. Hello everyone, I'm Substack. I'm gonna talk about static analysis really fast. Um, ah, there we go, I'll click that button. I can't really read it. Anyways, so there we go. Uh, let's just dive in and do some static analysis. So. I've got this library called Falafel, and it wraps around a Sprema, and it's super fun. So basically, static analysis, what it is, is, um, there we go, well, that's too big. Okay, um, so if we have a source file, like so, beep and boop, we can, of course, run it in Node or the browser or something, but that's kind of boring, right? Um, what if instead of running it, we wrote another program, uh-oh, that rewrote that program, why not? So we could do a require a Sprema, and you get a bunch of nonsense. Whoops. Oh, no, I can't see the bottom. This is terrible. I'm going to go like this. <laughs> yeah, I can't see the bottom. Ah. Oh, no. I'm just going to refresh it. And we're going to run it this size. Deal with it. OK. Because I can't give this presentation otherwise. All right. So yes, British it up and dive in. So here we go. Um, we've got some source. Ah, it's, that's going to be hard. OK. Um, we can require a Sprema, and there's a parse function. If we give the parse function some source, so we require fs.readfilesync inline, and give it that source.js, and then, of course, give it a string, not a buffer, because whatever. Um, well, that's not right. Whoa. Oh, shit. I'm in the node repo. That's why. Ah. Crap. Anyways, you get a dump with like some stuff in it, right? Um, that kind of sucks, actually, uh, especially in the REPL for modifying things. So we've got this library, um, Falafel, and you just require that. And then you can load the FS module and just stuff that source code directly into your, um, your source transform. So we'll read file sync source.js and get a UTF-8. And then we'll do falafel src, and we'll give it a callback. And the callback will be fired for every single node in the AST, the abstract, the abstract syntax tree. Uh-oh. Uh, it's too, uh, it's too s small, actually. That's why it, it messed up. Oh, no. Uh, you guys, you made me make it too big, and then it didn't work anymore. Um, OK. Anyways, so <laughs> luckily I saved it. So uh, we can just console log the node. So instead of, um, instead of writing the recursive traversal ourselves, we get, oh, all of the things, cool. Um, we can also like, test for the type of the node. So in our source program, we had a bunch of strings, right? Like uh, beep and boop and whatever. And if we want to um, like modify some of those, we could maybe look for, uh, so we've got type expression statement, type function declaration. We could maybe look for the strings. So those show up as type literal. So if node.type equals literal, capital L, um, then we can console log, right? Woo. <laughs> and so if we run that program, cool. So now we get fewer, right? We just get uh, those couple of strings. And you can see that the dot value is beep, and the dot value is boop, right here, right? Well, not there. but. Um, so that's super cool. Um, it's kind of it's kind of useless though, right? But what's really cool is that uh, you get a string back. So we can actually console log the output. In this case, it'll be the same. But if we call node.update, 
we can actually change the source in place. So if we do node.update, uh, we can get the original source by calling node.source. And uh, maybe we'll add uh, dot to uppercase. Just in place, why not, right? So if we run this program, we should get the source. But now we have a beep and boop, but now we've added on dot to uppercase. So we could actually like, right, we ran that with node, but we could actually pipe it back into node like so. Uh-oh, um, I've done it wrong. But um, if that had worked, uh, Oh, right, see why. Uh, we've also added dot to uppercase on that number. So we actually um, need to check uh, something else, which we can do very quickly. So if we console.log that node again, we'll see exactly why that messed up. So node.tr.js, ah. my enter key is broken. Um, so, right, uh, the reason why is the raw is, oh yeah, so the dot value, right. So if we check to make sure that that's a string, like so, and ah, and no dot value type, of, ah, type of no dot value, sorry. <laughs> Apologies, equals string, then our source transform, and now if we run it, yes, beep boop. So instead of modifying the program, we wrote a program to modify our program. Talking about vendor programming. OK, that was really fun. Uh, something more practical. Um, so basically, this kind of trickery is what makes Browserify tick under the hood. It's looking for all of the require calls in your program in order to recursively traverse the dependency graph. So why don't we just make that, right? Um, here we've got that source, uh, another source file that has some requires. And I'll just uh, cheat a little bit for time and steal that program we just wrote and copy it into the current directory. And so now we can, um, so here's our program from before. And now uh, maybe we don't care about the output, but um, if, so there's another node type called a, sorry, call expression. And uh, we can just print out all of the call expressions. Those are when, whenever you make a function call in your program. So console.log uh, node.source is a fun little function you can do in place. So we run tr.js now. Cool. So these are all of the function calls, require, require, and console log. So if we look back into our program again, um, we'll just uh, print out the node this time, not the source, in order to pick out the require calls, but not the console.log call. So if we kind of skim this, we can see that uh, the dot callee dot object um, Type identifier is uh, is well. It's a type. The callee type is member expression when you do console log, and the callee type is identifier when you do require. So you can kind of just like guess and test your way by doing a bunch of console log statements to figure out that you need to do and node dot callee dot name, which is the identifier name, equals require. And once we've done that, uh, we can just console log node dot arguments. I think it is. And once we've done that, yes, so here we go, one and two. These are the require calls from our program. Um, now we can prune this out a little bit more to do, um, just to print the value and not the whole thing. So zero dot value, and once we've done that, fingers crossed, bam, there are all of the require calls in our program. Um, this stuff is really, really easy. It's, it's not that difficult to write. I don't, I don't wanna say that it's easy because it gets complete insanity very quickly. But for simple stuff, it's re relatively straightforward. Um, and it's really amazingly powerful because you can do all kinds of crazy things that you just cannot do in regular programming, like, for instance, code coverage. So uh, suppose we have a module, like I've, here I've got a foo.js, right? And we have some code. The problem is um, we have some code here that will never, ever fire. This uh, false and never fires, this never fires function will never fire. Um, so we could write some unit tests against it. Like here we've got a test.js, um, and it tests the code, right? If I run this, it works as expected, and the exit code is zero, like, any, like a good Unix program. But if we uh, write a transform that can, if we could write a transform that could modify the source of our tests, of our, of our module code, or foo.js, we could actually figure out where in the code we've been and 
throw an error when we haven't been to some code paths. Um, that's basically how, how code coverage tools work. So let's just write one of those. I've prepared this one a little bit. So here we have falafel and through like before. Um, and we get like a file and you know there's some boilerplate here. This is the interesting part. So this tool would just print with console log. Um, first it'll print out the parts of the code where, we've, where we're going to go and then when we go to each part of the code it just console logs that node when it visits it for the first time. So we can keep track of the chunks and with a little through stream here we'll just buffer up all of the body and pass some code along to Falafel. Now this first part just defines some simple uh, simple variables to keep track of where in the code we've been, like the coverage stuff. And once we've covered something, we'll call the output function, the console log in, in our case, but only once. And then uh, now, in our recursive traversal of the dependency graph, we can just check for assignment expressions, call expressions, and just insert that function, which is called coverage wrap, into the code so that we know exactly where we've been, um, just by running it. So in order to run this, this code, we can just um, run a browserify transform, which you do with dash t, um, and we can just do a, the module that we just saw is called coverify, and if we do test.js, we get ah, all of this crazy code, right? But um, if we actually look into it, we can see that, that there's a part where uh, this is our, our foo.js file, and here we've got all of our coverage stuff from that that function that did a node.update to just insert a bunch of junk for bookkeeping, which is great, because now um, we can just run that output in node. Why not? So before when we did node.test.js, everything passed. Um, now it still passes, right? It's still the same program, but we have all of these statements that show us um, what parts were covered. So the first thing it does is it prints out where, where it's going to go, and then and then when it goes to a place, it prints a statement. And uh, we've got another little tool that comes with Coverify that lets you, uh, it keeps track of where you've been, and when you haven't been in a place, this is great, it, it prints out where you haven't been. So this dead code part fired because we hadn't been there. What's even crazier is instead of, whoops, <laughs> instead of running it in Node, uh, we could just run it in a local headless browser. I've got a command called testlink for that, it's on NPM. And so now it's uh, firing up with XVFB run Chrome locally, and it's the same output. It's like exactly the same program. In fact, it even has an exit status of one. It's great. Um, so this is the kind of crazy stuff you can do. Um, very quickly, another huge problem that you can solve with static analysis is the problem of dead code, an undead zombie code that's living in your program. So I just want to very briefly show you what the problem is because it's, oh, it's just really embarrassing. If, if you use a module that does require you till dot inherits, just you know, simple stuff you think should work, you get, drum roll, 87 kilobytes of code. The reason for this is that util um, brings in a lot of other modules um, from node core, like, you know, it's, cert, it's codependent with the cert, so it's like a circular reference there, and it has all this formatting and display code, all of this nonsense that you really don't want. You want that inherits function, which is this little tiny nine line function or something. It's, it should be really stupid, but there is an inherits module on NPM where you can avoid that problem, but if you're using modules that require core uh, util.inherits in your browser code, it's, it's kind of crap. Um, so I've been working on a little tool, it's not quite finished, but I can show you uh, what it can do, which, so if we've got a simple, so if we've got a, like a source file, like simple.js, um, we can just use this undead tool to parse out the parts that weren't reached. So in this case, we defined function f, g, and h, but we only called f of four, and f doesn't call anything else. So G and H got removed, and then when we called F, we defined three parameters, but we only used one of them, so those go away in the outputs. We're only using N and plus two, right? Um, tools like Uglify or Closure Compiler can do this kind of stuff, but what's kind of crap about it is that when they do, uh, so when you have something like util.inherits, it's doing exports.inherits equals in a function, and you get all of this other code, but it's like doing mutations, but it's a static property lookup, so it's, you could potentially do that. I think Closure Compiler might have some tricks up its sleeve in that respect. But uh, something like this, for instance, if you have an object with code, like you never call object.h, but it's just there anyways, and you never call object.keys on the object, 
um, that should be pretty safe to remove with dead code elimination, but we can't, we can't quite do that yet. Um, so with this tool, though, you'll soon be able to. Um, and I really think that we just, we just need more of these tiny tools, and like you, you can make a static analysis tool that you can pipe into Uglify and then get a really, really tiny bundle. And with these, with these kinds of tools, you can just like have amazing, crazy superpowers where you're slaying the queen and, and I don't know, doing, doing fun super stuff. So thanks, you guys.